Hey everyone, in this video I'm going to be going through the derivation of the conservation of energy equation. I'll start off by saying that this will not be a viscous derivation, nor will it include body forces, but I will account for those in another video. We're going to start with the uh, familiar first law of thermodynamics, uh, shown on the board here, similar to how we use uh, Newton's second law for the derivation of the conservation of momentum equation. So here it is written out, dE is equal to dQ plus dW, where dE is the change of energy in the system, dQ is the heat added to the system, and dW is the work done on the system. I use heat here, although I like the term uh, thermal energy more. I'm just using heat because it's more familiar uh, for most viewers. The terms that I've underlined in black uh, in both of these descriptions here are extremely important because I could also write this as dE is equal to dQ minus dW, and it would still be correct, but I would define this term here as work done by the system. And so you can see how uh, you can formulate this first law of thermodynamics in different ways, and you'll see different ways in the literature, uh, but it depends on how the author defines each of these terms. It's also important to note that the units for this equation are in units of energy, or joules, J, like this, I'll be writing uh, units in square brackets, and I'll be using units a lot throughout this derivation uh, so that we can keep track of them. It makes it easier to understand, so just make sure we always understand what the units are for these equations that we're using. Now, for flowing fluids, it makes sense to use rates for this derivation, which is how something changes with time. So I've drawn this arbitrary black blob here, and this is a fixed volume V, and I'm going to use V with a bar through it to, uh, to signify volume so we don't get it confused with velocity V. And so you can see that there's fluid flowing through this volume. It's stationary, it's fixed, and we have uh, the heat added or thermal energy added, the work done on the system. And what we're going to get is an integral form of the uh, conservation equations, which you can transform into the, into the vector form. Um, but we can do that in another video. And then uh, we'll get energy changes with time, which means we're going to get units for each term in joules per second. So that's how energy is changing with time. Now, I've rewritten the first law of thermodynamics into a form uh, for using rates. And so we can go through the terms here, and I'll color code them similarly for the rest of the video. So uh, when going through it, let's just think of a balloon, okay? And it's a permeable balloon, okay? And and we want to find the rate of change of energy in this balloon or that has a volume V V bar and that's going to be a and so how do we find out how that energy is changing one way is that we can have energy carried by the fluid that's flowing through it into and out of so we have this term here that says the rate at which the energy is carried into the volume through the bounding surface of this volume s Okay, another way that we can have the energy increase in this, in this balloon is that we have heat added to the volume. And then the other way is that we have the work done on the volume. And that's what these terms in this equation mean. So we're going to take this, each of these terms step by step, and in the end we'll just add all these or put, these, put all the terms in this equation, and that'll be our final conservation of energy equation. Now one thing to note is that we're going to be getting the final equation, the conservation equation, in integral form. And this is because we're taking some arbitrary uh, control volume with volume V. And to get the energy, or the rates of energy, um, in this uh, control volume. We have to integrate over the in, over all of the uh, all of the stuff that's inside this control volume. So we're going to end up with integrals in the final form. The first important thing to talk about is what type of energy are we talking about? And so. In our case, we have this internal energy, so the molecules in that, or atoms have, have a certain internal energy due to translation, rotation, vibration, uh, and the uh, rotation or the movement of atoms around the nuclei. And then because the fluid is flowing, we, it also has a certain kinetic energy. So the combination of this internal energy uh, and the kinetic energy will give us the total energy that we are trying to conserve in this equation. So let's look at the individual internal energy and kinetic energy. I'm going to start with internal energy here. The symbol is a lowercase e for energy. And you'll note that both of these are specific quantities, which means that they are per unit mass. So this is a, the internal energy per unit mass, which is why the units are joules energy per unit mass, kilogram. Now for kinetic energy, you're probably used to seeing one half mv squared. That's what you've memorized in high school physics. Um, but you can notice that the m is missing, again, because it's a specific quantity or per unit mass. This is the kinetic energy per unit mass. So we just take the one half mv squared divided by m, and we get one half v squared. And if you look at these units here, you can see v squared. I know 
know, velocity is meters per second, velocity squared is gonna be meters squared per second squared. And you might say, well, these units don't match up. But if we look at the units for joules, uh, the base units are uh, kilogram meters squared per second squared. So if I look at joules per kilogram, which is what the internal energy is in, I just take the joule definition here, and then I have one over kilogram, and the kilograms cancel here, and we end up getting meters squared per second squared. So these units are actually consistent. So the total energy that we're gonna be solving the conservation equation for, the total energy per unit mass is just going to be the sum of the internal energy plus the kinetic energy, so E plus one half V squared, and the units of that are going to be in joules per kilogram. So the expression for the total energy over mass or total energy per unit mass is just the sum of the internal energy plus the kinetic energy. So we have E plus one half V squared, but we actually want the total energy per unit volume, TE over V. And so if we're looking for the total energy per unit volume, that's joules per meter cubed, and we have joules per kilogram from up here, what do we need over here? And you can see that we need this to cancel. So we need a kilogram here, and then we need a meters cubed on the bottom. And you'll note that this term is just the density, rho, okay? And so in this case, we're going to have the total energy per unit volume is gonna be equal to rho E plus one half V squared like that. And so I'll include that in here, okay? And so how much energy do we then have in the volume? And to get that, we're gonna take the total energy per unit volume and just integrate over the volume. It's just adding up all the little sums inside of this volume. So we're going to integrate this term here over V. And that's what I've written here, is that we have this total energy per unit volume. And if we integrate it over the volume, um, then we'll get how much is actually inside this control volume, okay? And now this will give us something that, uh, I mentioned before is that we want these in the energy per unit time, so a rate equation, right? And right now we have, in this case, we have the total energy per unit volume, and that's in joules per meter cubed, okay? And then we integrated over the volume, which means we just got the volume there, so that's meters cubed, and you'll see these cancel out, but we still need one over seconds, and that's where we want to take the time derivative. So we're saying how is the total energy inside this volume changing with time? And this is our first uh, first integral part of uh, the conservation of energy, A. Now let's move on to term B in our equation, which is the rate of energy carried into the control volume through the control surface S. And if you look at what we need, we need uh, joules per second in our equation. So if you look at up here, I have the uh, total energy per unit mass, which we know is joules per kilogram. And then if I multiply that, if you look at this equation and this here, uh, you'll see that we actually need this term here, a kilograms per second, which you can uh, see is defined as the rate of mass flow, so rate of mass flow, kilograms per second, into V across S. And since we already know that the TE over mass is this term here, what we're looking for is what this term actually is. Now we need to know how the mass flow carries energy across the uh, surface of this control volume. So if you look at this little image here, this blue line is just uh, the surface bounding the control volume. And I've drawn a little slice here of some incremental or infinitesimal ds surface area with an outward normal n hat and then the velocity vector some arbitrary velocity vector could have drawn it any which way uh, v and so what we're trying to see is the rate of mass flow into v across s so we need the component of this velocity that's perpendicular to the surface uh, S here, which is what I've written here. And to get that, we can use the dot product or scalar product of the velocity vector with the uh, surface normal here, which is what V dot N DS is. And another way that you can write this or that you'll see this is just combining this into a single DS vector, okay? And if we look at the units here, we can see the velocity units are meters per second. There goes the eraser. Uh, and then the uh, surface is meters squared the surface area, and if you combine these two, you get meters cubed per second, okay? And that's a volume per unit time. That's not what we're after just yet, but one thing to note is that this is out of the volume, okay? The dot product of the, vol of the velocity and the surface normal, the surface normal always points out of the volume. So anytime you take the dot product, you're getting the velocity component uh, along that normal or along the other vector that you've taken the dot product with. So this means that the velocity that we've gotten here um, 
or not the velocity, the, the volume per uh, time is going to always be out of the volume. So what, how do we get it so that it's carried into the volume? We just put a negative in front of it. And so we'll note that we want the uh, kilograms per second, right? The rate of mass flow into the volume, kilograms per second. What we have from our V dot DS is a volume per time, meters cubed per second. So what do we need to get it to this? Uh, as is so often the case, it ends up being the density. So we have kilograms per meter cubed like this, you just keep canceling, we have kilograms per second here. And so I'll add that density down into here, and this is our final form of this particular part. Not the whole thing, just this part is negative, accounting for the fact that we want it to be carried into the control volume, density, and then the velocity dotted with the uh, surface vector. And here we have the product of these two terms here. We have the total energy per unit mass here, and the rate of mass flow into the control volume across the surface, S, and how do we get the total amount over the entire control surface? We just integrate across the the entire control surface. So we do a double integral, not a triple. We're only doing it across the surface. And we'll set that equal to our term B. And I'll just take the negative out. So our final term will be B is negative double integral, surface integral of the total energy per unit mass times the rate of mass flow into the control volume. Now we're on term C, which is the heat added to the control volume. And we're going to define this term Q dot as the heat added per unit mass per unit time. So if you look at the units of this, this is the heat added per unit mass per unit time joules per kilogram second. And what we're looking for in the equation is a term in, in terms of uh, units of joules per second, right, the rate equation. And so we have joules per kilogram second. You'll say, well, to get that, I could just multiply by the mass. But uh, we actually want to be integrating over the control volume because we have to sum up all the little pieces in the control volume to get the total uh, heat added to the control volume. So what we really need to have in here is some volume, meters cubed, to be able to integrate over. And if you look at this now, you can see that we have joules, meters cubed per kilogram second. And again, as is usually the case, to get to our final form, we can multiply by the density. And so you can see the kilograms go away, meters cubed go away, and we get joules per second. And so our final heat added term ends up being C is equal to the triple integral or volume integral of the density times this heat added per unit mass per unit time uh, integrated over the control volume. Our last term, D, is the rate of work uh, done by forces on the control volume. And there's a few types of forces, or a couple types of forces here. Uh, one of them are surface forces, and the other is body forces. I said we're going to neglect body forces forces in this case, so I'm just going to not even worry about it. In terms of surface forces, we can have pressure forces or shear forces, and we're not talking about viscous flows in this one, so I'm just going to get rid of the shear right now. So we're going to look at how pressure will affect uh, the total energy inside of our control volume. Now the equation for pressure that you're probably familiar with is this of force over an area. So if we rearrange this, we get the force is equal to the pressure times the area. In this case, what we're talking about is this differential ds area on the surface uh, of the control volume. Volume. And so I plugged in the ds here for the a. And if we take a look at this picture over here, you again see this control surface here with an incremental surface area ds, an outward normal n hat, and the pressure that's always acting opposite uh, or always pressing in on this control volume, which is opposite this n hat. So we can say that this force is equal to negative, because the pressure is acting opposite the surface normal, negative P n hat ds. And again, we combine this n hat ds into a single ds vector here. And if we're looking at the rate of work, because we want the rate of work done by the forces, uh, we can call that power, uh, which you're probably familiar with. And we can say that that's equal to the um, force dotted by the velocity. So if we look at the power equation, we take this force that we have here, this negative P ds, and then we're going to dot it with the velocity. And then I can just take the negative P out. It's a scalar. And we have ds dotted with the velocity. And I can just switch these around. It doesn't matter. And we have negative P v dot ds. Now we have this final expression, negative P v dot ds. And let's look at some units to make sure that they match up. Uh, just recall that joules is kilogram meters squared per second squared, and that newtons is kilogram meters per second squared. You can remember Newton because of the equation, Newton's second law, F equals ma. We know that the forces are measured in Newtons, and mass is going to be kilograms, and acceleration, you'll remember, is meters per second squared, so you have kilogram meters per second squared. Um, and so using this knowledge, we can look at uh, pressure here. And pressure uh, is a force per unit area, so we're going to have newtons per meter squared. Then we have the velocity, which is meters per second, and the area, which is m squared. 
uh, meters squared. And so if we plug in for newtons here, we're going to plug in kilogram meters per second squared, and we'll have kilogram meters per second squared. And we also have the meters squared on the bottom, so that's where this comes from. Keep the meters per second the same, meters squared uh, the same. And now here you can see that we can cancel the, these two m squareds, and we'll get kilogram meters squared per second cubed, and that's here. And now if you look at this from the joules, kilogram meters squared per second squared is a joule. And then we have one second left over here, and that's why we get joules per second, and that is the rate that we were looking for. So our d term is this, just take the negative out of the integral, we're trying, we have to sum up over the entire control surface. And so we will be uh, getting the negative of the double integral of the pressure times the velocity dotted with the uh, surface area. And if we wanted to add in viscous and body forces, this is where they come into play here. We could add in w dot viscous and w dot body here. And now we combine all a, b, c, d terms into one equation and we have the a, the b, the c, and the d. And you can see that we have a mix of volume and surface uh, integrals. We have two volume integrals, two surface integrals. Uh, it makes sense because uh, we have the change in the, uh, in the energy uh, inside the rate of change of energy inside of the volume, so we need to integrate over all the volume elements. When we're talking about through surfaces, we are integrating across the entire control surface, so we're integrating across the control surface here. And then another case here where it was the work done on the control volume, but the pressure uh, acts on the surface of the control volume, which is why this is only a double integral. And now, in the final form of the equation that's most useful, I'm going to bring this over to the other side, this over to the other side, so we have all positive values on whatever side, and we get the term here, and plus this term here, plus this term here, and I'm leaving this on the right-hand side. And this is the final form of the uh, conservation of energy equation, not accounting for viscous and uh, body forces in this case. So thanks for watching.